Good evening. Welcome to the evening services of the Northfield Church of Christ. This is Sunday evening, August the 2nd. And so we are going to sing a few songs together. So if you have your song books handy, I'll give you a moment or two to uh, get them. And we will sing, we will have a couple of prayers and I will deliver a message to you. So first, I would like you to turn your songbooks to song number 449. Since the message this evening will revolve around the Word of God, our Bibles, uh, all four of the songs that we are going to sing are related to the Word of God. 400 and 49. Are you ready? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Number 432. 432. How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Thy word the choicest rules impart to keep the conscience to keep the conscience clean to keep the conscience clean. Tis like the sun, a heavenly light that guides us all the day. And through the dangers of the night, a lamp to lead, a lamp to lead our way, a lamp to lead our way. Thy word is everlasting truth. How pure is every page that holy book shall guide our youth and well and well support our age and well support our age. Stay opened at that opening and sing the song right across the page. Number 431, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the laws, thy guide, Lord, 
Sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth. pray with me, please. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this time that uh, we can gather together in your name, howbeit in a virtual fashion here on YouTube. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, you would find our praise to you acceptable and that I can deliver a message that uh, will touch us just a little bit and give us some insight into your word and Uh, how we should handle your word. There are many in our group that uh, have physical ailments. We're so glad that uh, you have been with Eldora Ali and that she is uh, doing much better. Uh, We're so glad that uh, Elsie's uh, brother, Matt, came through his surgery well. Uh, We pray, uh, dear Heavenly Father, that you would Uh, be with uh, Linda's sister, Barbara, as uh, she struggles with some uh, physical ailments. And on a personal note, I pray that you will be with my brother-in-law, Phil Sweetwood, as he is dealing with some health issues that are related to aging. I pray that you would bless all of those. And uh, I know that uh, you tell us through the epistle of James that the prayers of righteous man, men are strong and powerful. And I pray that uh, our prayers to you and our petitions to you are answered and listened to. Be with us uh, through this evening. Continue to bless us. Continue to find ways to stay in touch with one another, uh, that we may lift one another up, encourage one another, and comfort one another when necessary. I pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And if you would place a song before the lesson, number 450. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. 1 and 3. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wonder long and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that radiant peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal, Hold up that splendor by the open grave. 
show me the light from heaven shining portal show me the glory gilding jordan's wave give me the bible holy message shining thy light shall guide me in the narrow way precept and promise law and love combining till night shall vanish in eternal day thank you i hope you enjoyed the song part of our service that we praised god and let him know that he is worthy of that praise as you uh, probably got from the the tenor of the songs a uh, message this evening is going to be about the bible and i actually had this uh, in our bulletin i hope you read our bulletin this morning and i pray that you uh, were uplifted by this morning's uh, service at the building and if you weren't able to get the to the building. It was live streamed and you could pick it up on YouTube. Uh, I also would remind you that we will not have a Lord's Supper ceremony this evening, but if you are at this point in your day and you have not taken the Lord's Supper, uh, you can go back to uh, this morning's service, our live stream service, and if you wish to take the Lord's Supper with them, you can do that. Uh, my, my title is, is fairly simple. The title is Rules for Bible Study. How many of you like to read? Now, we'll just we'll put the Bible on the back burner because it's going to come up under the full heat in just a moment. How many of you enjoy reading? Do you have favorites? I remember as a child... Uh, getting a library card when I was like seven or eight years old. I remember right where the library was in my hometown. It was this little building. It's actually a kind of a museum now there on Vine Street in Hamilton. And I remember taking that library card and proudly uh, taking books out. I took books out uh, every several days. Uh, my reading habits changed just like I'm sure yours have. Those of you that know me know that uh, I love sports and much of my personal reading library are sport books, especially baseball. But believe it or not, I'm broader than that. I do read of current events and I do read biographies. My favorite author in the last 15 or 20 years is a man by the name of David McCullough. David McCullough writes stories about things that have happened and specific people. I've read The Making of the Brooklyn Bridge. I've read the story of the Wright brothers. I've read the story of John Adams, and I recently tackled, oh, and I say tackled, a biography of President Harry S. Truman. I say tackled because the book was 900 pages long. So what happens to you when you get engrossed in a book that goes into many, many details? What are some of the things that take place during the reading of that book? I know when I uh, read Harry Truman, and I really enjoyed it, and just to give you a, a slight background, you must understand at my age, Harry Truman was the president when I was born. And so the first oh, seven or, or so years of my life, Harry S. Truman was the president. Jane and I visited the Harry S. Truman uh, Presidential Library in Independence, Missouri. And so I was very interested, but 900 pages. And so I would read until I got to the point where I couldn't read anymore, slip a bookmarker in there, and pick it up the next time I had a chance. Now, I want to let you know that uh, the most important by uh, the most important book that we have, the most important book 
that there is to us in our lives is our Bibles. And the Bible is a book that not only must be read, but that must be understood. If we turn to Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, it says that by revelation there was made known to be the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which is in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophets in the spirit. The Bible is a book that not only must be read, but can and should be understood. Now, if we go to chapter 5 of Ephesians, I have one more scripture here. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17 the words are, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, the Lord doesn't thunder his words down from on high to us. He doesn't talk to us directly as he did to the patriarchs or as he did to Moses, as he did to the prophets. He speaks to us through his inspired words. Read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And so, although this might seem elementary to you, I'd like to share with you this evening some rules that should apply as far as reading the Word of God. There are some rules that help us to understand the Bible. Now, by the way, I told you about that Harry Truman book. Just as there are rules to understand it when you tackle a book of, of that uh, size, there are rules to understanding everything that you have read. And so I've got nine rules for you. All right? They're all going to start with ask. All right, ask. First, when you read the Bible, ask, who is speaking? Not everything in the Bible is a message from God. For example, if we go right back to the beginning, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it said, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. That wasn't God talking. <laughs> that was the serpent. That was Satan talking to the woman. Now, sometimes God is speaking. Sometimes, when we read our New Testament and the letters of the Apostle Paul, it's an apostle speaking, or Peter, or James. And so we need to ask, who's speaking? Now, there are other times some who are not God's spokesmen are speaking. The false prophets might speak. So first, as you read your Bible, the first thing you must address is, who's speaking? Two, to whom is this spoken? Not everything in the Bible is for all people. For example, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible commands, quote, Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. All right, you guys, you ready to go out and build an ark? Bible says it. It says, go out and get some gopher wood, whatever that is, 
and build the ark. Have you started building yet? Of course you haven't. But because you understand, you're reading the Bible with understanding, and you understand that these words were spoken to Noah. God wasn't speaking to us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But understand, Jesus said those words, and he said them to the apostles. He was speaking of that special day on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would come down, and they would literally be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so, to understand the Bible clearly, we must understand to whom are the words being spoken. Three, what kind of literature is this? The Bible contains many different kinds of literature. It's one of the things that makes it so, uh, so fascinating. For example, there is some wonderful, wonderful poetry in the Bible. There is some amazing history in the Bible. There is some amazing narrative in the Bible. And one does not interpret all of these things exactly the same. We don't interpret history and approach it the same way that we approach poetry. Any of you that have read other things other than the Bible understand that. For example, poetry is not interpreted in the same way that one interprets history. So thirdly, let's take a look when we read our Bibles as to what kind of literature it is. Fourth, what does this word mean? You know, uh, context, let, let, me, let me go back. What happens <laughs> when you read something and a word pops up and you don't understand it? What do you do? What do you do? Now, Back in the old days, we went to Webster's. We went to the dictionary. We didn't go right to Wikipedia. So if you're young and you're listening to this, the dictionary is actually a book and it has definitions of words. And so we go to the dictionary and find out what the definition of the word is. If you don't understand a word, it may be difficult for you to understand the whole sentence and what the author is getting at. And if you don't understand a sentence, you may get lost and, and you may lose a complete paragraph. By the way, it doesn't take a special dictionary to find the definition of most words. A regular definite dictionary works almost all of the time. Now, in conjunction with this, number five, we might ask, what does the writer mean by this? What's he mean by this word? And now we come up with the term context. Let's look at it within the framework of what has been said. More than just a dictionary definition, there are words that have more than one definition. I can love a candy bar because I love chocolate. And I love ice cream. But I also love my wife. I also love the Lord. I also love my brothers and sisters in the Lord and my family. And so there are words that might mean something different. For example, the word bark may be the sound that a dog makes, or it may be the covering of a tree. The only way we get to understand what the word means is within the context of where we read it. 
Context is the only way. I'll give you a really good example. In the book of James, James likes to use the word works. He says faith without works is dead. He describes works as actions that prove our faith. If we have faith, we will show it through the work that we do. Now, in the book of Romans, Paul uses the word work to mean that which earns one heaven. So, not only does somebody need to consult a dictionary, one needs to use this gray matter in there between our ears and look at the context in which the word is found. Six, how does the word uh, fit into the sentence? Here we go. We'll go back to our grammar days. Is the word a verb? Is it a noun? It is a modifying word. Is it an adjective? Is it an adverb? Read the whole context and find out within the context what the words are discussing. And those words come alive to us. It's why we read, to have things come alive to us. Seven, where does this context begin and where does it end? It's very, very, very rare in any of the reading that we do that we find one verse or one sentence standing alone. Most sentences in our Bible fit within the context of several verses before or after that verse. You may have heard this in Bible studies. Um, and I've conducted hundreds of Bible studies in our home. And I say, okay, uh, read uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5. And so the person who is knowledgeable in the Bible gets their Bible out, turns to Ephesians uh, 3, 5, and says, wait a minute, if I just read that, we may not quite understand. I better read verse 4 before I read verse 5. You know what they're doing? They are reading within the context. They're reading the whole context to find out what is being discussed. And then we reevaluate the sentence because of the context in which it is found. And so how does this context fit the message of the book? Do you know what? It, each book and each chapter in our Bibles have a message. Just like my message this evening is different than Bill Will's message in services this morning. And so sometimes the context of the scriptures that he might use, even if he uses some of the same ones that I do, will fit his lesson differently than the ones that I use for mine. If one's interpretation of a verse is contrary to the message of the book, the verse needs to be reevaluated. We have to look at it again. And finally, ask ourselves this question. And here's where people that like to tap dance on the Bible, here's where they get their ammunition, all right? And so listen to this carefully. Does this context correspond or contradict what other parts of the Bible teach on this topic. Did you get that? Did I get too wordy for you? It even sounded wordy to me, and I, and I said it. So let me say it again and, and break it down. Does the context correspond or contradict what other parts of the Bible teach on this topic? topic. Now, here is what I have found out in all of the Bible study that I have done throughout my life. 
Bible verses do not contradict one another. The Bible is a well-woven together piece of literature. It contains the Holy Spirit inspired words of God. And so, as I conclude the message this evening, understanding our Bible is not something that is just for certain individuals. None of you out there should say, I'm just not smart enough to read that thing. I don't get it. Yes, you are. The Bible was meant for you to read it and understand it. And you know what? Here's the truth. God expects us to read it and understand it. We read it and understand it by meditating upon it. It's a big book, and sometimes the, sc the size of it scares us away from trying to understand it. And we not, may not be for certain what a passage means, but we can be certain of what most passages teach. Because we don't quite get one passage, doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to understand other passages. My wife loves to do jigsaw puzzles. I don't have time for them. I'm just not patient enough. But she has such wonderful patience in doing the jigsaw puzzles. Think of the Bible as a jigsaw puzzle. The more you study, the more the pieces of the puzzle you put together, the clearer the picture becomes. The clearer the picture becomes. Why? Because the difficult passages now become clearer. God says you can understand the Bible. God tells us that. And I ask ourselves, and I finish our lesson this evening with this very, very important question. Why would God give us this Holy Spirit-inspired book? Why in the world? This is our guidebook. This is our life manual. This is where we find God talking to us directly through his Holy Spirit-inspired words, through the prophets, through the apostles. Why would God give us this book if he didn't think we could understand it? We can understand our Bibles. And I pray that this lesson has uh, brought that forth to you. And if you see me again uh, in the not-too-distant future, and there's a part of this lesson that you don't get, I'm willing to share some time with you. I pray that you will continue to be safe, that you will continue to be healthy, and that you will continue in the Word of God. Let's finish this service with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this time together, and we're so grateful that we find the truths of your words wrapped up in your Holy Bible. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, and help us to understand that uh, our Bibles must be read and meditated upon each day. Help us to get into it each day. Help us to fit the parts together. Help us to be wise. Help us, even when we don't understand words, to find out what they mean. Help us to find the context of the scriptures. Bless us as we, as we study it, because we know that that's where we find your truths. Continue to be with us during the week. I pray that you'd be with us the next time that we meet together, whether it be in person or be with in this medium of YouTube. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to love you and each other more and more each day. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. God bless you all.